Um, well, it's an absolute pleasure and I'm delighted to be able to, to, to speak um, with you all tonight. Um, uh, and thank you, Stefano, for reminding me how long my career is, <laughs> and how old I am. Sorry about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I've had a wonderful career. And um, yes, um, my career has been split into three areas. So as Stefano said, uh, my first main career was a, a full service career with the Royal Air Force, um, working across the whole of Northwest Europe, um, the UK and uh, America. Um, and then um, I had a short career working um, with our family business when my parents came, became quite ill. Uh, uh, and then um, during that time, I actually took my master's degree at Teesside. Uh, and that's how I actually ended up uh, working at Teesside University. And I started there in 2000. Uh, but I've maintained my contact with industry. Um, so I'm very lucky on one side of my heart, it says industry. On the other side of my heart, it says academia. Um, and I've had extensive uh, experience, both working with the most wonderful people and the most wonderful organisations, um, some better than others. But uh, as part of the development pro processes, which is what I do, um, and I think that's a really important role of universities in terms of working with industry, is to break the cultural barriers between university and working, especially with small companies. Because um, they kind of see us appear, and actually, in reality, we're on the same level. We want to achieve, achieve the same things, and that's you know creating better working environments, both for us uh, and for industry. Uh, and part of my talk tonight is is to share with some fantastic research that I've been doing with. Um, you read to the next slide, Stefano. Uh, is, is, is working in, uh, in partnership and in collaboration with um, uh, Leeds, Northumbria, uh, Sheffield, York St. John, um, and University of Bradford. Um, and, and all of these universities are in the north of England, because that's what we're developing. We're developing a northern partnership of, of universities. Um, and it's a new partnership. Um, uh, so um, uh, it, 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 we're we're, it's growing um, and as we speak I'm organising a writing retreat for us all to go away and, and actually move that partnership into a, a strategic partnership where we can provide even better uh, sharing practices and act as what I, I'm passionate about universities as, uh, um, operating as an anchored institute and we anchor to our liberal communities and, and share and develop knowledge. And it's a win-win. We learn from industry and industry learn from us. And I think that's really, really important. So I'm going to be talking to you tonight about um, uh, remote working um, principles that have emerged out of doing some research with um, SMEs. And uh, this research started in March 2020, and it's still ongoing. And uh, we're working with 30 companies at the moment, but this will expand because it, it's live research. And we go back to these companies every three months because it, it's this because hybrid working now is I think it's just going to develop more and more. So we need to be talking to our organizations and keep in contact with them to see how, how they are growing with it or not. And that's just as important. Um, so we've done observational and qualitative um, data collection. So um, observational, uh, we actually go into the companies, talk to them, see how they're working with um, uh, digital uh, technology, or other types of technology that, that um, assists them. And through these conversations and through this observational and qualitative research, what started to emerge was um, a set of uh, remote working principles. Um, and we've identified, so far we've identified six, we're probably gonna identify another three, but I won't talk about those tonight. I might do those maybe as, a, a, as an updated talk next year, Stefano, when we've got them in, in concrete. 
Uh, but the data we have got, and I think this is really important, especially when you're working with practitioners, is that we're sense checking for um, validity, uh, pragmatic sense, for practitioner sense. Uh, because when you're dealing with industry, they will look at academia and think, well, yeah, sorry, mate, but you're not talking my language. I have no clue what you're talking about. So it, it's going back to the say, do you understand what we are talking about? If you don't, we need to understand your language so we can use that to pass it on to, to other organisations. Um, yeah, and so that's ongoing, and uh, we're continuing to uh, data collect and also um, sense check, which is really important with the with our policy makers, if you like, in terms of our trade unions, our local councils, our local educational partners. Yeah, okay, so the rationale for the research, why is it important, why is it relevant? Um, and uh, we know that many employees and businesses extol all the benefits of working from home, but, but that brings unintended consequences. So uh, enforced home working has impacted hugely on social, social relations at work. Meetings have become more uh, in instrumental. Um, and, and interactions more fleeting because meetings on, on the digital uh, platforms seem to take longer, whereas you can pass a person in the, in the corridor and have a co corridor conversation, which takes two minutes. That then turns into a 40 minute meeting on the digital platform and more people want to get involved. So it's kind of like, it's, I, always, I think of it as a piece of popcorn. It just like it explodes into something that becomes quite unmanageable. Yeah, and then we've got changing work patterns that have blurred the boundaries between the workplace and home. Certainly, I've noticed that. And, and with blended forms of work, we become more task orientated uh, and transactions. Oh, God, I must get this done, or I need to get that done by such and such a time, or I need to meet that objective. So it becomes much more um, structured and uh, time based with many more deadlines put in place. And this approach can be dangerous, a scepticism then concerning home-based le learner may exasperate uh, workplace tensions. So if people were thinking, well, okay, um, I was struggling with this in the workplace, now I've got it in the workplace and at home, and people are finding actually time management and prioritizing um, is becoming quite tricky and quite a challenge. And what we've discovered is that, yes, we policymakers are saying all sorts of stuff about, well, hybrid working is fantastic, it works for everybody, it's the way forward. But that's policymakers. And what we want to do, we want to go back to the little people and actually hear their voices and cover their voices and uh, find out, you know, existing workplace inequalities, unresolved conflict, while whether working at home or managing the phase return to the workplace, um, because all of these have received less attention. Thanks, Stefano. So, the Centre of uh, Small to Medium Enterprise Development and the Institute for Research and Organisations, um, based at the University of Central Lancashire, um, they worked with regional, regional partners across the northern region. So that's the partnership that I showed you at the beginning with Sheffield, Teesside, Northumbria, etc. So um, uh, UCLan have led this, or they led it from the outset, but now we're all sharing the workload. And out of that, we want to provide small to medium sized enterprises with a set of principles to support uh, remote working and hybrid working. Um, and these principles uh, were and continue to be underpinned with rigorous research carried out uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, sense check with uh, our policymakers and more importantly with the SME community. Because quite often they are missed out in the communication process. And uh, these have been developed in dialogue, uh, in dialogue with businesses 
and business support organisations. So what's the context? Sorry, Stefano, can you go back, please? Yeah, oh, sorry. So what's the context is rooted in the COVID-19 pandemic, we envisaged that these principles evolving with time as well learn to navigate through new ways of working um, will be applicable to many different contexts. So all sizes of businesses across sectors and across nations. So I hope tonight when I show you uh, the principles that we've developed, you will see relevance and be able to take from them uh, and apply to your, to your context. And please do take them and use them. Uh, we're, provide, we're producing a proper little pamphlet, uh, which I will send to you, Stefano, once we've got it properly polished up. Um, uh, and please, uh, we'd love to have uh, distribution of these principles uh, and some feedback on them as well. Thank you, Stefano. So SMEs. So SMEs, um, I'm sure it's the same in, in your countries. There are our, our economic bedrock. Um, and certainly in this country, in the United Kingdom, um, they comprise 99% of all businesses. Uh, there are nearly... Um, oh, sorry. There are nearly uh, 6 million SMEs employing over 15 million, million people and generating a turnover, a turnover of 2.2 trillion. And I think all of us know that SMEs have hit, it, it's been a devastating hit to some organizations, um, but uh, it, it, the SMEs in our region were facing huge financial productivity challenges even before the pandemic occurred. And therefore these principles have been developed to support productivity and the health and well-being of, of employees. So the six principles. So they aim, um, or the aim of them is to support businesses in managing remote and hybrid working, um, and focus on flexibility, skills, development and training. Uh, we're looking at the employee voice, involving them in the process. It's from their voices that we've actually developed these principles. Um, I'm looking at social relationships, digital presenteeism, and physical and mental uh, well, health and mental well-being. So they are the, the underlying philosophies out of which these six principles have uh, emerged. Okay, so real theory, these are individual principles. They do overlap and interact with each other. Uh, they are designed to be common sense and pragmatic, which we find is absolutely critical. It's a critical success factor for anything uh, that um, uh, academia do uh, in terms of getting it into industry. <clears throat> it has to be real to them because academia, uh, a big one, industry don't care about academic language. They don't care about we've got a doctorate or not. They don't care about if you're a professor. They care about whether you've got a solution to their problem. That's all they're interested in, and it isn't going to cost them money. They are the two critical things uh, that uh, industry considers, certainly in, in our context. So we have to bridge those barriers um, to, to, to help our, our, uh, our small communities. But what we have found is that businesses who are embracing these six principles are already starting to report high levels of um, uh, uh, employee satisfaction. And also they are starting to be able to recover their business because in the UK um, and certainly uh, in England, um, according to um, the latest statistics, we are about to lose 250,000 small businesses who will close due to COVID. Uh, and I think that's a devastating figure. Thanks, Stefano. Right, so what are the six remote working principles? So we've got flexibility, we've got skills development and training, we've got employee voice, we've got social relationships, 
we've got digital presenteeism, and we've got physical and mental health and well-being. So over the next couple of slides, that's okay, you can move on, Stefano. Um, I'll be talking about each of the principles um, uh, to help us to, to see, well, okay, so we've got six, so why are they relevant? Um, so the first one, flexibility. So the principle of flexibility is, is to understand um, how we work together, uh, to consider the needs of employees and the organization to achieve secure, sustainable and productive work. Uh, especially with, uh, within a COVID context, <coughs> excuse me, we've got long hours, we've got damaging work patterns and uneven impact, uh, pardon me, on women, our all known impacts of working at home. Also, we face the highest levels of unemployment in recent times. I am talking about the UK context. Um, and our staff are the greatest asset of an organization and, and growth will be high on the agenda, on the, on the agenda when, when the pan pandemic is over. And we've been quite relieved to find also as part of our research that now we have quite a few of our organizations who are about to start recruiting again and also to bring back their staff, which is a great relief because notwithstanding if we're going to lose 250,000 organizations, uh, most of our organizations, um, we've got more who have survived than who are going to close, which is really encouraging. And that's down to them and their innovation. And their, their ability to be able to so uh, in terms of practical uh, solutions, yeah, talk to your, your people about the impact of um, the boundaries about being contactable and non-contactable, because you'll, you'll find as, as we talk through these principles, the working day is becoming longer and the boundaries between the working day and the non-working day are blurring because it's very difficult to people, for people to be offline and they forget that it's okay to be offline while you are still at work. But then people, certainly I've noticed myself, I mean, I know we're all very con work conscious and you know, we are not nine to five people, uh, but even my hours now have become longer because everything is taken longer to do because of the digital requirement of, of, of that working place. So and if you're looking at returning to the workplace, you know, put individual needs at the heart of that return, talk to employees about their needs and the situation of the business. So it's not just about having business meetings, but to remember people are human beings and talk to them as, and engage them as human beings when you're discussing and, and consulting with them on, on, on a work base, uh, on a digital platform. Yeah, and especially don't assume the needs of employees and employers are the same or static. They are ongoing and change. Um, uh, so for example, um, I've got two people in a company who I'm working with who are profoundly deaf, and they actually find working on a digital platform quite difficult because they have to have three interpreters with them. So it's, it's kind of like dealing with those sort of, oh my goodness, while well, you don't realize uh, the needs of, you know, um, uh, uh, invisible disability that you cannot see on a screen. And plan for also, it's not just about plan for changes with your employees and your employers, it's the changing demands of customers and key stakeholders. You know, so yes, it's, up, it's upholding flexible patterns, okay, but there's a double impact of um, customers being more demanding, the workplace being more demanding, and that encroaching on our home life and our work-family balance. Yeah, so for example, um, we have stopped them doing emails at weekends. I was just having to tell them to stop. They wouldn't normally do it because that's their time with their families. And secondly, clients will get used to people replying on Saturdays and Sundays. So then it'll turn into a norm and an expectation that they will have in future. So it's all about make, managing and making sure that the staff get downtime, but managing client expectations. 
we are managing tensions between being a good employer and meeting business needs. So then we have skills development and training and the underlying principle here is that we need to support skills development and training. Uh, we need to ensure employees can meet the changing needs of the business while focusing on development and progress of the whole workforce. And the context. So in order to make productivity challenges and skills gaps, it's important that employees are development, uh, developed to meet these, new, these new, new demands. And certainly from my own experience, even working with students, and my, my colleagues will all tell you, um, before this year, I was a complete IT dummy. And if anybody said to me, oh, you need to record a lecture, I'd run screaming from the room. But now, because um, I should largely see workplace learning and learning on the job and learning from my colleagues, I'm much more confident on, on a digital platform. And actually, I really like recording my, my stuff, uh, it's a bit for business or for um, the students. So at the moment, I'm developing a mentoring thing for a small business, and I also develop stuff for my students. And both of those I'm doing by recorded sessions. It means they can dip into them when they want to, or they go back to them to, well, you know, if they didn't, because sometimes I, I talk quite quickly, uh, and I'm quite aware of that sometimes. Um, uh, so uh, if if I if I'm talking quite quickly and, and the student can't quite hear, then they can go back and check their understanding, or the employers can do they can break my session down into bite-sized pieces. So it's really really helpful. So, you know, reassess the needs of the business. You will have people who are skilled at digital stuff. You are, will have people who are not skilled. And quite frankly, you will have people who are literally terrified of it. And they will have resistance to that sort of change. So that also has to be, be dealt with as well. Okay. So, yeah, keep a focus on development and progress for all employees in the organisation. Uh, and ensure new employees have a clear development and learning plan um, and commit to supporting the skills development. Don't just say to you know, your, your um, employees or whoever you're looking after, your, your end user client, end user client, if you like, uh, okay, well, uh, here's a training manual, get on with it. Yeah. Make sure, because as part of leadership and management, you know, it's part of manage, monitoring evaluating and controlling and, and inputting and, and make sure we're there for people to talk to us and come to us and say, oh, well, I really like this, but I've got a problem. And then, and then you, you, you can talk together at the host and come up with a solution to, to that problem between you. Yeah, okay. Yes, employee, employee voice. That, this to me is probably, um, in my view, one of the most important. So the underlying principle here is um, understanding the employee voice, but you have to facilitate it. You have to allow it to be heard. Allow people to talk to you and facilitate that. So embed communication, uh, communication strategies where worries and tensions and conflict um, can improve to, uh, can it, can exist to improve workplace relationships. Conflict is, is a good thing. It shouldn't be dampened down. And that you allow people to express their tensions, um, to get things off their chest. Because if they don't, then they will harbor these tensions and they can become quite ill feelings. And then you have a dark stuff being fed into your great spine, you know, the hidden communication that goes on. And also get people being stressed, they felt they're not being listened to, they don't feel part of the organisation, and then they start to be, uh, feel quite alienated. And that's exactly what you don't want in this type of new environment. Because people, uh, especially on a digital platform, can already start to feel quite lonely. Yep, okay, uh, uh, give employees um, uh, uh, their voice in terms of uh, their experiences of remote uh, and hybrid working. Certainly my colleagues, we talk to each other quite frequently and um, 
several people come up with great ideas or suggestions or they've come across problems. Same as when I'm working with the companies, they'll say, well, yeah, yeah, we want to talk to everybody at the same time, but that's quite problematic. So think about who you need to talk to at a particular time. So allow time for um, uh, uh, people to come to you and also facilitate uh, methods of communication where they might not talk to you directly, but they'll have a confidential channel of providing you with information without being identified. Yeah, okay. Yes, so create worker forums to openly discuss the challenges of the business and the tensions of employees, especially um, with remote working and, and new hybrid um, types of working. We are human beings, we're naturally gregarious creatures. We like being with other people. And, and it's really important that, that, that people are, are put together in some shape or form, which is why Teams is great, Zoom is great, but make sure that um, people are engaging, they feel confident to engage. Uh, I mean, my colleagues will know that I'm not afraid to talk, in, uh, to, talk to anybody, and I usually have quite a lot to say. But when I start, first started on a digital platform, I was actually quite quiet for a long time. Um, so just remember, you know, it, it might take people um, time to embed or get used to these types of, of communication uh, methods. Thanks, Stefano. Yes, yeah, social relationships. Uh, again, this, this is a, a, another um, key area of, um, I've just said we're gregarious creatures. So, and working on a digital platform or via a digital platform, it, it, can, be, it can be quite lonely. And I personally, I found it quite difficult when we were first and forced to work from home um, because I worked with a fantastic group of people. We were always passing each other on the corridor. We would stop at the photocopier, have a chat. We'd stop in the kitchen to have a chat. You know, and that actually is where a lot of problems are solved through these informal conversation, uh, 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 corridor conversations. Of course, these aren't happening now because of the digital platform. So we need to be creative to enhance this informal di dialogue across organisations in an inclusive way and enhance trust and commitment. Uh, I mean, the, I think one of the, the, the things that or a hazard of um, remote working is a lot of meetings are recorded and that can also make some people quite uncomfortable and not come forward with what they actually want to say. So that can dampen openness, if you like. Yes, so the context. We know that isolation and loneliness are serious impacts of the pandemic, especially for small to medium enterprises. And we also know that social relationships and connectedness at work are, are extremely important. So some solutions offer ways and time for employees to connect to each other, encourage employee-led conversations, um, focus on new employees and developing social relationships. Yep. Uh, ensure remote and on-site workers are interacting with each other and engage uh, or, uh, encourage time out so workers can engage in social relationships outside. Our school is very good at doing this. Pardon me. We've got um, loads of team sites but we've got one in particular which is um, Tubbs or Tubbs. We've changed our name now. We are Teesside University International Business School which is very exciting. Uh, but we've got a fantastic site where it's just in general, and we all go in with really funny gifts, um, uh, what, what kind of shoes I bought last week with jokes, or, you know, um, I'm baking a cake, what flavour should I make it? So it's all informal, great fun stuff. And currently at the moment, um, uh, we're deciding where to go for our next organizational party 
So that's a good sign, you know, where we're getting back together. And it's really important, especially for us, because we've got so many new staff. Yes, okay. So, yeah, it's about being creative to enhance the informal dialogue across the organisation. But actually, it's more than that. You know, um, we've always had an informal dialogue, and it's ensuring that that continues and facilitating that in a way that, um, you know, people don't think they're being watched or listened to or recorded. So we need to avoid the big brother factor with informal dialogue, which is a hazard of working or communicating on, on a digital platform. Thank you, Stefano. Yeah, so an example. Um, I was there nearly every day in January and February. What made me realize as well, during this time, it wasn't just about the physical location, it was about the connection with the people. And now I will probably go once a week for the social side. So it's about dipping in and out of the facilities that we've got. So we have, we have a site that's available all the time for our informal dialogue. And I'm encouraging, uh, there's a few organizations that I'm working with and I'm encouraging them to do the same, but it means that that's, that, 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 that space is there but they do not have to be in that space all the time. And it's a bit like a virtual coffee room where people can go together, have a, have a, a virtual coffee with each other, just talk about informal stuff in general. You know, so, and, and usually it's, it, it, it's not about work and it's designed not to be about work. It's where people can continue their friendships, they can talk about their plans. Um, and it may be, you know, the talk about well, okay, it's work related, but you know, I'm writing your paper. Do you want to come and get involved? Or uh, have you heard about this conference? I'm going to. It sounds really exciting. So it's where you can share stuff that's not usually in formal meetings. Yeah. Okay. So yes, the crux of the matter: digital presenteeism. So be aware of digital presenteeism and work intensification. This is the critical hazard of hybrid and remote working. So the underlying philosophy here is we need to, uh, about guiding our principle, is we need to set clear guidance demonstrating around what being at work means and set boundaries around the work-life balance. So communication technologies can intensify the work of employees. Presenteeism impacts productivity and damages the well-being of the workforce because they feel a need to be constantly online. And we should not assume that being at work is always the best thing for employees and businesses. So talk to employees about the impact of their work hours. Are they getting work creep? Is their work creeping into their normal home life hours? And consider the different uh, impacts of, uh, on your different types of employees. I mean, women, um, as much as you know, we like to think that it's an equal world and it's the 21st century, but women still bear the brunt of looking after dependents and being responsible for the house. And ensure fair and equitable workloads and responsibilities across teams. And ask yourself and your teams if working less can achieve more. Because people, the longer people are on um, or at their workplace, it's likely they'll get tired, they'll start to go into burnout. It's almost like um, they, they work a week's worth in a day. And so the next day and the next day, they become less effective at their work because they burnt up the time that they should be reserving for the next days. Yes, 
Okay, and um, so um, setting clear guidance demonstrating that being at work can be not online, uh, encourage conversations about managing customer demands in a timely manner. Because as I alluded to at the beginning, the longer you're working, the more your customers will expect you to be working. And that then will become a normal expectation, which down the line can will probably become quite difficult to manage. Yeah, encourage time away um, from a, a, a desk, evening work hours. And this is especially uh, important for physical health. Um, if you are sat at your computer, <coughs> excuse me, for eight hours of having a break without having a break, that can lead to all sorts of physical um, health hazards, uh, blood clots, cramping, uh, bad posture, backache, uh, headaches, dehydration, screen eyes. So there's all sorts of things that we as managers and leaders really need to ensure uh, that we include those in terms of looking after our people working in, in hybrid environments. Yeah, okay, yeah. So first, consider the impact of current work patterns and cultures. Thank you, Stefano. Mm. Yes, this is a really good example of this. So it's a bit overwhelming at times. For me, you know, Zoom, emails, social media, and it got a bit too much because you were seeing everything rather than a, a one, uh, a, 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 rather than a one-to-one -one conversation, and then going into a meeting. To me, there was a sense that it was coming at you from all directions. Okay, yeah, so. And all of that kind of is wrapped up in, in physical and mental health and well-being. So you and your employees are your greatest asset. And uh, we have a law in this country, which is our health and safety at work law. And in actual fact, we are legally obliged as employers and also as employees to take care of ourselves. So we are our own risk and we have to risk manage ourselves in terms of health and safety in the workplace. So it's important that we, we support our, our employees and, and be open and, uh, and ensure that they know that, that if they're starting to have problems, that uh, you will listen to what they have to say. Remember about the little voices. So, Share information that can help managers and employees with their health, safety and well-being. Check in on workers, uh, listen to concerns and anxieties and act on them. Signpost employees to relevant support. So, for example, uh, we have Public Health England and also um, a mental health support body called MIND. And start with basic policies around sickness and absence and performance management, et cetera. Um, certainly when I started working on a, a digital platform, oh God, it was taking me forever to do something before that I could have done in 10 minutes. And that really affected my, my confidence. And I'm, I'm quite a confident person. I thought, oh my God, I, this is really getting in the way of me performing in the workplace. So I was mindful of that. Um, and I did have discussions at the time. Uh, so look, I'm really concerned about my lack of knowledge and, and ability and, and capability of working on these, these platforms. And it, it, it's just through um, colleagues and, and support from other people you know, that gave me the confidence to, to develop um, my skills in, in this area. Yeah, and encourage um, uh, uh, existing policies widely but go back to them, revisit them. Are they still fit for purpose in a remote working environment? So your sickness policy, does it include, you know, um, I've got screen eyes from, from, from working on a digital, digital screen or 
um, I really need a break. Can I just do, you know, um, with hybrid working, please, can I be online but offline? And they shouldn't have to ask to be able to do that. That should be in your policy. Yeah. OK. And also what I find is also really important is is avoid having back to back online meetings because it doesn't facilitate people taking a proper break they feel obliged that they have to go to everything even though they might not have to go to everything they may well feel obliged that they do have to so make that clear as well and then encourage workers to type take time out of work so um with me um because i'm terrible i i, I, I Working in the world of computers, I'm sure you, you feel the same. Five minutes working on a computer, usually in effect, is about five hours. So it's almost like you, you're operating in a different time zone when you're working on, on a computer and you lose track of time. So I put an alarm on, I put my phone on for every hour to remind me that I've worked at the screen for an hour and that I need to get up and have a walk around. So it's, an, it's not about, you know, yes, of course your employees are at work, but manage it so that you're making their work safer and healthier for them to be operating in. That way you won't have them going into burnout. You will do your best to be mindful of, of health and safety and welfare. You know, welfare often is the hidden aspect of health and safety. You know, it's mind and body that we need to take care of. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, so I know it's going to be pretty hard. I know that. I know potentially my anxiety and my depression are going to threaten, but I know how to handle them. When responding to working away from family, the knock on from that is that I feel lonely and vulnerable and isolated as well. Because if anything happens to me, Nobody can come to my rescue. It is quite, and from another uh, of our participants, it's quite easy to work seven days a week. <clears throat> but the mental health of my staff is very important to me and probably as important as their physical well-being. So that kind of supports my, my statement about, you know, it's not just about um, uh, uh, the physical body, it's also the mental state and well-being of people as well as you know, the physicality. Thank you, Stefania. So um, a, a quick summary. So <clears throat> the importance and relevance of our SMEs to our local economies, I'm sure yours are as important to your economy than uh, as they are uh, to ours. So we need to look after them and we need to hear what they've got to say. So we need to facilitate and uncover hidden voices to understand and come up with pragmatic solutions to enable them to work in hybrid and remote working environments comfortably with confident and increasing levels of confidence and relatively safely. And also um, the added value of that is it helps us to develop our relationships with industry and it helps to bridge the academic and practitioner divide. So next slide, please, Stefano. So, so hopefully um, you will have found um, uh, our research and our set of principles insightful and uh, you can take something away from the principles to help you with your own practice, your own organisations, and if you're working with other organisations, please do feel free to take these out and, and disseminate them. It would be our absolute pleasure for you to do that. <clears throat> thank you. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Um, I think that I stop sharing. Just look at uh, what are the kind of uh, questions that came through. Uh, yes, there are um, any application yes. Of, of, yes, is it okay if I go, if I go through the, the comments? Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay. So 
So, so the first one I can say is uh, the application of these principles to SMEs um, in this region could, yes, of course, please do. We'd be absolutely delighted. Uh, take them and um, uh, if your students, with their permission, um, certainly let us know what their findings are. Um, and uh, if necessary, and if relevant, we, we'll add their findings to ours and credit them for, 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 for doing so. Um, a cultural study could also be done. Yes, be delighted. Um, if you want to email me afterwards, if you want to pick that up. Um, uh, we are looking at um, uh, scoping this up to be a bigger project. So anybody who would like to get involved and get involved with them, perhaps in bid writing, uh, yes, please. <clears throat> um, Catherine, so there is a question from yeah. Yong Sheng actually, in terms of digital presence, so that presenter is Mensona, how could we make sure that someone is at work or just log in and run away? So basically the idea is that, <laughs> well, Yong Sheng is actually asking a question like kind of, um, and also he's suggesting that you present this to the leader of your business school, actually. Thanks God it's not my <laughs> business school. <laughs> so I, I don't know, you, you can try. Oh my, do you know what? It's like being with children. They always let you down, don't they? They really do, so, my yeah. lovely colleagues. So Young yes. Cheng is suggesting yes, that. Yeah, <laughs> no, but a good question yeah, is actually, yes, in, indeed, um, the, the presentism actually, uh, we, we are talking here, like the, the reference you, I, I have a few questions actually, it's kind of, I was thinking like, I want to ask you a couple of things. Do you, do you think actually this, um, this uh, pragmatic principle, let's say working principle to be implemented and so on, they might be to some extent culturally sensitive or do you think they might actually, what, what I was thinking, I, th I probably a, an interesting study that could actually come out following this one would be to see if you take the six principle and you change the culture cluster, if different culture cluster would give more importance to some of the principle rather than others, for example. What do you think about that? Yes, uh, it, quite likely. I mean, it would be an interesting study. I mean, I haven't put them in any particular order, yeah. so they can be changed around to, to meet uh, different uh, cultural needs. But of course, also, it would depend on the stage of the development in the country as well, because the mm -hmm. assumption is that everybody has access to a digital platform, mm -hmm. uh, and that might not be the case. Yeah. You know, so if we're looking at Africa, for example, um, we're dealing with uh, a lot of it is, is small crafts mm -hmm. um, uh, and also a, a lot of farming. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of agriculture, there's a lot of tourism. Tourism probably will be fine with digital stuff. The farmers might not be. Um, yeah. Certainly, uh, I mean, I'm doing working with some schools in Uganda and I know that um, uh, the women who I'm working with they don't have access to digital platforms outside of their workplace. Mm -hmm. So the only time they've got access to digital stuff, is, but, and that's probably actually quite healthy because it means yeah. then they don't have a sense of commitment <laughs> to stay on their yes. blooming computers all day because they don't access them, mm -hmm. you know? I see. So, um, so yes, I, I think context would be would be relevant. I do think the ranking would be an interesting study. I mean, I have I have my two preferences. Yeah, my that was my following question actually. What is yeah. your ranking here? So, uh, if I have to ask you in, in light of your long, long experience in this field and so on, so and I'm asking, okay, Catherine, can you rank them? So give me the first three. So what you would pick? Oh. Gosh, um, I, right, um, health and safety. Uh, skills development. And, oh gosh, um, um, oh, mm, I, I'd be hard pressed to prioritize one out the, the remaining four. But definitely skills development, health and safety, 
Um, I think social relationships actually. Yeah. Social relationships, me because I'm a, I'm a, a social bunny. Um, yeah. Then skills, and then and then health and safety. Probably yes, probably mm -hmm. they would be my this, top three. You would you you would basically take these three as the kind yeah. of leading the core per one. Personally, and then, from my experience. Yeah, personal. yeah, yeah. I'm just asking yeah. you based on your like standing experience and so yeah. on. Yeah. When I go into organizations, the first thing I notice or the first thing I look for is how people interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um because because that to me is the be all on and end all. If you're not having people talking to each other, nothing works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Or it only works in their silo. Um, let me see if there is more question. Yes. My company has already implemented many of these principles, but many of our employees can work remotely and therefore able to apply. However, many uh, small medium enterprises often require people to be physically present, such as hospitality, manufacturing, retail. The, the challenges are the same, maybe minus the screen eyes. And therefore, how do you foresee these types of industry applying these principles? Right. Well, I think what we need to remember is that prior to COVID, there were already organizations who were working on digital platforms as a normal part of their whole shift. So if you're working in hospitality, for example, um, if you think about the reception area in a hotel area, the first thing you will see is a concierge or, or a receptionist working behind a machine. So that, mm -hmm. that's, that's part of their normal life. With, um, and I do think that uh, uh, digital working will become a large part of the new normal. But I just, the main concern that we've got is, pardon me, because where people work now is, is the encroachment of digital work into non-working time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one, one of the biggest issues we really need to be mindful of, because then the cascade effect of that will be it will start to pe affect people's health, uh, <clears throat> health. It'll start to affect people's work family balance. It'll start to affect uh, work productivity, motivation, uh, job satisfaction, uh, expectations of customers. So it's a massive domino effect. You know where one thing knocks on uh, to to another. Has that, has that answered the question? Yeah, so it's just like specifically, if you if you if you have any idea, you can apply this kind of. I think the question was directed more like, uh, except the screen eyes, but when it comes to you know like this more in presence type of job, you know, like these kind of things, like the 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 application of the principle. But I assume that the principle are mainly designed. Are you talking about presenteeism? Yeah, for example. Yeah. I think so yes. Kind of, well. Um, Yes, so, so go back to, um, right, so, so uh, presenteeism is, 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 is a normal acceptance, is a normal work behaviour for some professions, but they've learnt how to work for that work environment. Mm. So you will see, <coughs> excuse me, people who work in those environments, they are very good at walking away from their screen. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact, quite a lot of them don't have a chair. Mm -hmm. So they stand at their screen. And as part of that, uh, I mean, people are standing desks now, but you, part of your training in those work environments and your risk assessment in those work environments is you are supposed to do leg exercises mm -hmm. and you are supposed to walk away from your screen, especially if you're standing. Mm -hmm. But that's part, they are used to those. So if you if you look at airports, um, when you go and check in, if you look at well, they don't stand for most of the time they're there, but they do swap. If you notice check-ins, they swap every thirty minutes. So they usually they move, they rotate every thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. Receptionists 
they get up and move around a lot. So if you're looking at, uh, I'm terrible, I, I'm the worst person, and I know that my colleagues, and I know people who are getting used to these or trying to get used to these work environments, they are stuck at their computers and, and their, their bottom is stuck to their chair and they forget to move. So they need to start to build inbuilt alarm systems, the mental alarm system to help them, to remind them, this is why I have my phone here and it has my alarm on. Um, in fact, I should really do it every 40 minutes because that's the requ requirement. You know, you're supposed, every 40 minutes, you're supposed to get up and walk yeah. around. And, and my smartwatch will tell me time to stand, you know, after 40 minutes or after an hour. You and know, I do, it, I, know, I used to ignore it, but then I thought, no, actually I do need to stand. Because I was finding at the end of the day, after working eight hours, my legs were, were actually numb. And that, you know, that, that is not a good thing. <clears throat> that cannot be healthy. So yes, it's being mindful. And also talk to your people, don't make assumptions. So yes, you might think, okay, well, the only thing we haven't paid attention to is screen eye, but are you sure that's the only thing that you need to pay attention to? Have you spoken to your people? Is there anything else that you need to be mindful of in terms of health, safety and welfare um, uh, working in a hybrid uh, environment? I see. Uh, there is another interesting question, actually. Um, your findings point to the need for employee voice. Yeah. Uh, but uh, how you might cope with suspicions about how the information is received or used in the in the, if they criticize the behavior and approach of the organization, for example. Yeah, then you oh. make it anonymous. Mm -hmm. You facilitate an anonymous route for mm -hmm. communication. And yes, you might get some silly comments in there, you know, but just get rid of those. Mm -hmm. But it's a bit like, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not, it's completely different to whistleblowing, for example. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not, a facility where they're, they're telling about bad practice. It should be a facility where they're telling you about their needs and gaps about stuff that you are not providing for them. And it can work both posit positively and negatively. So you might seek views on, well, we've introduced this new system to help you. Um, How's it working? How can we improve it? What are the benefits? Is it rubbish? Should we get rid of it? Or what else can we replace it by? So yes, of course. And also there will be people who are really shy, especially if, there's, uh, if you've got a large influx of new employees, they might not think they've got the right to speak yet because they've not embedded within the organizational culture. You'll have generation, you'll have age gaps, you'll have older workers who might have completely different attitudes to younger people. You know, so, I mean, it's a general assumption that older people don't work well with digital or technical stuff. Um, I would probably say that's a bit of an old argument now because older people are engaging more now with um, technology, but they've had to. I mean, we know in this country now, in the UK, we can say that, you know, uh, instead of change taking three years, we've had innovative changes that have happened in three months. So it's almost like the COVID environment has forced us to change, to accept and adapt to, to working in new and different ways. I have another question. I find it hard to engage in scheduled or expected social engagements online. Is there an approach that an employer could take to encourage this kind of experience, but without the sense of obligation for a participant? Yes, it should be on a voluntary basis. Mm. And then people who do get involved, encourage them, not you as a facilitator, but encourage your participants in that social Formal uh, place to share their experiences with others and say, "Look, oh look, come along! It's great. We had really good fun. 
-hmm. We had really positive conversations. We caught up with each other. We had a virtual coffee. So it's all about communicating, telling people, you know, it's a diff this is not the actual formal workplace. This is a space where we're there in a virtual environment. So it's almost like we're as close to what we would be doing in the workplace, but not quite, but nearly. And talking over each other and, and laughing together and, 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 you know, having a coffee and dropping your biscuit in your coffee and everybody laughing at you and, and stuff like that, you know. And, and make it short, you know, a maximum of 20 minutes so that it doesn't interrupt too much with the working day. Any other... Does that, does that help? Yeah. Any other comments? And lunch times, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you... It depends on what shift work on, on your shift structure. So if you've got a standard working day, what I call a standard working day, which is, what, eight o'clock till six o'clock at night, and you might work seven and a half hours within that period. <coughs> so you can make an hour available for people to dip into and out of. So you can have what we call uh, paper bag lunches. So you bring your paper bag with you, you dump it down in front of you, you eat your sandwiches, you have your drink, you, know, you listen to what everybody is saying, you take part in conversations. And then when you have a tea break or uh, an informal break, then you just bring your drink mm -hmm. or not, or just be there to talk to people. Oh. You can also have um, a virtual um, area. Uh, we've got a fantastic one in our school, the school which, which I was describing earlier on. We have a team site which is called, it's just a general site. So it, it's two together general. And that's mm -hmm. where we go in and, and we put all sorts of stuff in there. It might be that I had a really nice bottle of wine at the weekend. So I tell everybody, you know, I'd show them the bottle and say, this is really nice. It's available from Tesco's at 6 99 Lovely, go and get some. Or it might be, um, we know it's somebody's birthday, so we'll wish them happy birthday on there. But we can leave a message. We don't actually physically have to be there. Yeah? So you've got the virtual um, where you can leave stuff or you can have a, a, a virtual conversation without actually seeing each other. Or you can create the teams. Uh, they don't have to be there, but you do want to encourage it. So, so let your participants share the good word about, well, it's great. I feel really good, but a relaxing time. I've seen everybody. I know everybody's okay. Because we miss each other in the workplace. I certainly find that. I'm dying to get back to the office. And I tell you, I never ever thought I'd hear myself saying that. Mm -hmm. Great. Stefano, um, yeah. Marcello has a, a, a question which takes us off the direct topic of the lecture tonight, but certainly is relevant to uh, to Catherine's background. Do, do you see that there? Uh, so which, it came which, earlier. Which question? Oh, uh, Marcelo. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you for your talk today. Sorry, I missed that. Oh, sorry about that. So the input is highly appreciated. I would like to ask you, what advice would you have for someone aiming for both career in academia aiming for doctorate or research and professional sphere. What skills are vital in order to thrive in both of these worlds? Thank you. That's really interesting. It depends on which world you want to be based in. Um, so as, a, as an academic, I can work in industry but also what we are doing more and more now is we are getting um, several of our industrial colleagues to come in and talk to our students. But it depends, it, it's very difficult to work in industry and also take up a teaching post. Because you just wouldn't have the time to do it, I don't think. And also it would blur your commitment to which organization you want to be with but certainly my choice would be if you want to do both I would <coughs> excuse me 
if you're lucky like we are, because uh, we get research leave every year um, and we get quite a lot of holidays um, and I use that time to go work in industry. I'll do it on a voluntary basis and that usually uh, comes back with lots of different other opportunities. So as um, because I love the world of academia. I've, I've been very lucky. I've loved all of my careers, uh, but I really love working in our university uh, because it provides me with opportunities to go do other stuff as well as, well, actually as part of my academic career. So with my doctorate, I worked with an organization. Uh, I did my research with one organization for three years. Um, uh, and that was a fantastic opportunity. And because of that, I'm now working with other organizations in a similar field. Um, and my knowledge and experience uh, that I've developed from those in terms of identifying what works for an organization, I can then transfer that into other sectors within industry. So it's actually, that's a really difficult question to answer, but, but my, it's harder to work in academia because you have to get your, you, you, it's unlikely now you get a post with that within academia unless you've got a PhD or a doctorate or quite high level professional qualifications. You also need your teaching qualification, certainly in the UK. And I would, I would suggest it's easier, easier to have temporary breaks from academia to go work in in or with industry than it would be breaking from industry to come into academia, unless you're a nurse or one of the medical professions or um, a, a, an engineering profession, um, because quite often it's very difficult to get academics in those fields, simply because they're not paid enough as an academic. <laughs> so we've got practitioners who come and teach from the engineering and the medical world. Does that kind of answer the question? Mm -hmm. that, that's yeah, a very difficult so. question to answer. Depends where, so. your, where your heart lies, you know? Mm -hmm. No, no, it is, yeah, thank you. Yes, you could. You could start in academia, um, to industry and then come back into academia. Um, if I had my choice, that's probably what I would have done. To be honest, when I was a child, uh, I was profoundly deaf till I was the age of 16. Um, and if anybody had said to me uh, in, my, in my youth that I would end up uh, with a doctorate uh, working um, in a university uh, and also working in the industry, I would have just laughed at them, you know? So, um, but you've got to work hard. You know, you've got to go and poke people in the chest and say, I would like to do this. Can I go and do this, please? You know, um, and, 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 and get support, go and find out, I want to do this. How can I make this happen? Yeah, Catherine, I have another comment coming through the Q&A. So one of our lecturers, uh, Dave Gannon, uh, teaching HR classes, is asking if it's possible to have access to your PowerPoint that I have and use the PowerPoint in his classes as well, if it's possible. Of course. Yes, of course. Not a problem. And... Um, uh, um, the only yeah. thing, anybody can take these and use them. What I would be grateful for is if you can come back to me and let me know that you're using them, because then well, yeah, I, of course. I can include that in in in, in, um, in how we've de disseminated these principles. It, it's not a case of me saying, "Well, no, you can't." That, Absolutely. That's not it at all. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, please take no, them. I, I, it'd be not... an absolute pleasure to share them. Uh, yes. Um, as I said, like kind of you are going to use it like in normal classes and so on. And actually to follow this up, um, uh, I, I was just thinking like kind of like while you were talking, you know, this, the, the, the principles which are pragmatic principles, they're rather like kind of, you know, simple and very intuitive, but actually I was kind of doing a sort of self-reflection and probably I don't follow any of those actually. I have very bad practice. 
Uh, they are, no, they said they are very simple and intuitive. And one would say, okay, isn't that common sense? Yes, but when you observe your behavior, then I just realize actually probably I don't do any of that. So, and then I say, okay, that's a reason why, what is the value of that actually, the proposal. Um, the, the idea I would have is that actually, because the uh, business school and the college itself, as, uh, as you have in T-side and so on, an industry network, I would like to take this kind of opportunity to ask you if um, maybe we can kind of uh, sit down later on, but actually we can formalize, you know, like a sort of set of questions and running around these principles uh, in our industry network and get back to you and the Institute in Lancaster as well to get a feedback. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so we, we can actually kind of create a sort of, let's say, uh, a cultural kind of like maybe difference, maybe something different will emerge. Uh, I think actually the, yes. the, the, the big advantage is that the principles are kind of like pretty simple, clear with the instructions and so on. And it could be really kind of easy to collect and gather this information in organization. Well, you see, that, that, that's one of the main points. They are pragmatic because- Yes, it, that's exactly the point of it, right? So by having it pragmatic and simplified in this way, yeah, organization from, might like they, that. They emerge from the practice. Yes, absolutely. So yes, of uh, course. Please do. I, I would be delighted to follow up with that um, later on, Stefano. Okay. Um, so probably the the best thing to do. I I don't know. The the other thing I wanted to ask you is a bit more technical. But uh, do you 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 said that you based on observation and uh, qualitative analysis, right? So which method, analytic method, did you use for analyzing the qualitative data? So to have a consistency, if you run the same experiment by using those principles. Um, yeah. So to yeah, have so a, a sort of, you know, like kind of, so we don't do like different methodology and so on. We should have a same, yeah. same, same method and so on. How, how yeah. did you actually analyze with the team those qualitative data? Thematic analysis. Oh, thematic analysis. Thematic okay. analysis. Thematic analysis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, and then yeah. from the team, you proceed to the formulation of the principles from the team emerging. Exactly yeah. That. Okay. So, exactly okay. Perfect. That. Like, yeah. like, like an inductive study. Okay. Perfect. So, um, okay. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, there are any other questions from the audience? I hope people found it useful. I think, as I said, it was very interesting. As I said, the the um, the the kind of as idea, you know, why we're reflecting on this. I said, yeah, they are kind of very intuitive, practical, simple, and so on. Like mostly like related to common sense, but actually, I don't do any of that. So it's like kind of yeah. you know that you know. As I said, we we can follow up on this and see how to implement locally the research on our industry yeah. network and distribute. Uh, the principles and to kind of have a sort of qualitative kind of feedback and collecting data. So it can actually, yeah. in some sense, promote a cooperation with Lancaster, Teesside and other universities. You, yeah. you, but you but you're a... right about common sense, you know, but, but then how common is sense? Yeah, well, you know? no, exactly. So that's a, no, that's exactly the point. So at the end of it, one say, oh, well, isn't that common sense? Yes. But then when you think it through, actually, I mean, personally, I don't do any of that. <laughs> Almost zero. Well, I think you're being like, a bit hard on me. I think you're being a bit hard on yourself. I'm, I'm sure you do do some of it. No, but, I, I, but I, see, would, I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Um, yeah. No, I, I think it, yeah. I, I, I do. There is a late post in the Q and A from Juan. Oh. Uh, how will SME develop? Oh, okay, practice? so. Uh, How will uh, small and medium enterprises develop practice will beneficial to the business environment? Okay, so basically, I think the question is addressed to, uh, so if basically the implementation of this principle, you can think that it can actually benefit the, you know, the development of small, medium enterprises adopting this principle, how that can benefit the business environment? Well, um we certainly found that there's less sickness, mm -hmm. there's less absence, that, because people will be absent but not necessarily to notify you that you're sick, that they're sick. Mm -hmm. um, and actually that's what, that's currently what we're 
exploring, because remember, this is still alive, this research. So um, I would like to think that maybe later on, I can come back and give you uh, another talk on how they have actually benefited, because that's, that's just what we're exploring at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you find any kind of, let's say, correlation with the, the, the performance of the organization? Yeah, but, but people were, were working so long that it was affecting their productivity, their output. And when um, some of the organizations, that they stopped them doing emails at the weekend, mm -hmm. and then their productivity uh, increased. Um, and in actual fact, we, but we are we are the worst defenders. Um, our mm -hmm. university tells us we are not supposed to email colleagues at night time, but we yeah. still do. We are supposed yeah. to email people at the weekend, but we still do. So actually, we need to learn ourselves about how to behave appropriately. You know, some of us are not very good examples of how to behave appropriately within a, a, a hybrid work environment. But to be honest, I did that before COVID anyway, mm -hmm. you know? So I think we need to be careful. You know, COVID is not responsible for absolutely everything that is, is, is causing changes at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, the digital revolution w was happening anyway. It's just been greatly sped up because of, of COVID. How can we tell if... Uh the performance is negatively or positively impacting the business when it's not obvious. So, so I think the question is how we can actually kind of see that is because of malpractice or not following this principle that actually the performance is not that good for organization. Um, well, it depends. Uh, I mean, have you got performance measures in place? Yeah. Because normally, organizations nor, don't. normally small and medium don't have that. No, so, they don't. No. If you talk to an organization about a performance measure, they will look at you blankly and say, what? What is a performance measure? You know, I mean, they don't even know what KPIs are a lot of the time. No, you most know, of the time. so yes, it, 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 it's a very good point. And it's a point that we try to stress to organizations. You know, you can't measure if you've got no. And um, is in place, so you need some place first before you can measure anything. But again, see, talking to your people that's the best way because it's a people impacting process. Talk to your people and, and allow them to be honest and open. That, that's the key thing, you know. If they've really struggled with it, um, then, then, then let them tell you that they've struggled with it. Not that they're struggling personally, because that's probably not the case, but that they're struggling with is the time management. It, it's the it's the expanded workload that comes along with digital stuff. I mean, I know myself as an academic, instead of getting one email from a student, I'm now getting five or six because I'm not there talking to them in person. No, it's actually, I mean, I mean, if you're talking you know, specifically about, about the academia and university is actually true. Uh, the engagement with students, and there are many sitting here at the moment, but I can actually kind of witness and kind of see that actually duplicated, quadruplicated the amount of exchange yeah. of emails, obviously, yeah. because of the type of working environment. So, um, and that actually has an impact, of course, like, in take you, taking you a bit out of the normal working hours because you have to answer to all the emails because of, in some sense, principle of fairness towards all the students, right? So, and, but it's actually very true that the conversation actually is increasing in massively in terms of email exchange. Uh, I think it goes across all universities everywhere. Yes, and I've got students, uh, uh, yeah. But, but what I'm sad to see is that, you know, I've got students apologizing to me, saying, I'm sorry, I need to ask you another question. So, so this is what I mean about communicating. So the first thing I go back and say, please don't be worried about talking to me. You know, phone me on Teams 
or I don't care how many times you email me. You know, my job is to look after my students. I mean, I don't want them emailing me like 20 times a day or after nine o'clock at night, you know, but they should have the confidence um, to be able to, to come to us when they feel a genuine need to, you know? So, and I've made this clear to my students and also to my organizations out in industry, because a lot of them, uh, they're still, some of them have got back to work. Um, but I, I'm working with one organization, it, 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 a, 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 not a bit more north to me, and they, they, are, they are not back in the workplace now, except for essential staff, you know? So I have to work with them online or via a digital platform. And I've noticed that my communications with them have also increased. So the, the, <coughs> excuse me, the communication trails are longer and more frequent because we're not there talking to them in person. So a five minute conversation now takes about 14 emails. I mean, that, that's just a, you know, just, that's just a, a ballpark figure, but it does take longer. Uh, actually, uh, I have another interesting question, which is coming through. Um, yeah, it's actually, it's a very good question from our, one of our finance lecture, uh, Bruce. Uh, Bruce Guy, actually, that he's pointing out that there are plenty of initiatives that are driving the areas of ESG uh, into corporate reporting inside in the European Union. So, for example, the GRI framework is generally used for reporting all the non-financial activities of organization. Do you think, is it realistic to think about having these principles incorporated in non-financial reporting? Would that be something interesting? I do, but support them with some performance measures. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, I use um, Etienne Wenger's six-factor value creation model, yeah. um, which is very good, actually, because it looks at, um, you can look at return on investment, so you can look at financial values, but you also look at non-financial values. Yes. So, what's the immediate gain? Uh, so you've got e immediate, mm. short, medium, long-term, and reframing values yeah. as part of those six components. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of them in terms of, uh, I use those as performance measures in organizations, but for something that's not quite as tangible as financial metrics. Yeah, no, actually, indeed, is a very good model. It, it does actually a chance to... to, to... Uh, to assess the non-tangible, right? So they're kind of like normally what is not measured financially speaking yeah. in terms of assets and so on is actually excellent. So, but it could yeah. be actually an idea that actually uh, the non-financial side of the reporting of an organization would be including essentially these principles and how actually they are kind of in some sense implemented even in small medium organizations because one of the student uh, no, one of the attendees actually is from Johnson & Johnson was saying that Johnson & Johnson does implement this very similar type of principle already in that type of organization, but we are talking about a large size organization. Here we are talking mm. about small, medium enterprises. Um, the, the, there is another question actually, which is interesting. Was any type of metrics designed for evaluating the implementation of the principle and their effectiveness? No, but no. we are now looking at. Uh, uh, now you are developing. Wenger's, now you yeah, are developing the yeah. metrics. The, the metrics to see yeah. how. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we're not strictly using metrics. We're using Wenger's 2011 uh, value creation framework. The Wenger's one. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because that that allows us to look at value creation and impact, rather than metrics. Well, yeah, because normally metrics is, yeah, that, that's the issue that's normally classic. It's very metrics. difficult to measure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yes, you can do the financial cost of, of sickness absence, I yeah. suppose. Um, and you could do financial metrics of, of uh, perceived working overtime or unpaid overtime. But that's mm. not what we want to measure. Mm. You know, we want to measure the impacts in terms of soft outcomes for the organization rather than the 
the hard, tangible financial metrics. Although, mm -hmm. of course, they're important. Mm, some other student actually suggesting that it would be interesting to take a look at the student feedback on digital campus in regard to what was discussed today. Uh, so to see basically if there is any kind of interesting kind of similarities between the principles and so on, because if we interpret like studying as work in some sense and to see how a yeah. bunch of the data will mirror the results from your research. The first year was the hardest especially due to the uncertainty about behavior, speaking, expectation, et cetera. Um, um, so uh, one of the other uh, member of the audience, actually, which is a member <clears throat> of the Global Forum for ACCA, uh, the Global Ethics Framework and Network and so on. So he's actually very interested uh, if you'd be interested in developing this framework for the reporting side, I suppose, uh, and uh, working together on this. So if you are yes, interested. Yes, please. So. It, 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 it pass by email on to all interested mm -hmm. parties. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm, I'm really um, excited about working with and collaborating with, with partners, wherever they may be, and we really are very excited about developing these, these principles with, within different contexts and with different partners. Yes, we, we'd love to very much. Mm -hmm. any, any other comments, questions? Uh, even though I think we are approaching almost, well, eight o'clock for you, so nine o'clock for us, but um otherwise you would break your principle i don't want to do that it's just tonight you know like kind of um we should all stand up at a certain yeah. point anyways um oh gosh that's right yeah so well catherine do you actually realize actually yeah. just broke the rules actually so <laughs> so i don't want i don't want to actually kind of you know so um, uh, I think that actually we, we set the ground for many interesting projects, actually. I think we will kind of probably um, recollect soon and meet soon uh, for sure. a brief meeting. So maybe with some of the faculty and we can kind of as well, I think about implementing the research locally. If this can be kind of interesting study abroad. Um, yeah, starting definitely. from the northern part of northern part of UK, and we can implement it locally here, definitely. And also, uh, I think it's very interesting the idea of following up on the ACCA because the reporting part of it, in terms of processes, probably for organization accounting of using this principle, might be actually an interesting kind of um, development for the GRI reporting and so on. So. Um, I think he's actually very interesting. So, so thank you, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, really. It was very interesting, actually, to see um, the the results of fresh results of this research. Actually, it's kind of very interesting. Uh, I'm pretty sure that, as I said, we will take it forward by actually kind of you know um, implementing it in a different ways and so on locally as well. So, um, and develop kind of projects together. Uh, between the two research sure. units and very looking forward for this and expanding on it. Um, so I would like to thank you once again. I'd like to, just to thank the T-Side Business School and uh, thank you personally for accepting the invitation, for spending two hours with us, talking to our students and all of us um, about your research. And um, I'm looking forward to see you soon. Um, some seminars in T side or here as well, like kind of uh, from now on, sure. we will meet often. So, <laughs> and um, uh, also, uh, I just would like to take the opportunity the fact that, as I said, like it's going to be a sort of cooperation over the next five years between the T side business schools, as Catherine knows that, and Xioxian that was here with us. Um, and uh, we will develop several of this like kind of exchange of knowledge and projects together. And it's going to be for the next five years uh, in terms of research and innovation and development of new projects and so on among the different faculties and students as well, by the way. So I just would like to thank you once again for your time. Thank you. And um, 
Oh, it's a pleasure, and and thank you, and I, I uh, thank you, Doug, and uh, thank you to to everybody who, who who took their time to come along and and listen. Uh, it's very much appreciated, um, and thank you all for your lovely uh, comments. Thank you, and uh, thank you everybody who attended. Thank you the audience who stand stay with us until yeah. very late, and uh, thank you for listening. And uh, I'm sure it was extremely interesting, very informative, and very kind of. I, it, it encouraged some reflection. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, right. have Thank a you good very evening, much. everybody. Good Thank night, you. Everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye.